All right, <laughs> how about we start? Uh, welcome to an adventure, everybody. Um, I see I'm off center and you know, it's fine. <laughs> uh, we're on time this week. Um, uh, if you were with me last week, you remember things were a little uh, muddled and um, things are in order this week. Uh, the upgrades to the space that they were working on last week are in place. And so um, uh, hopefully things are a little more stable going forward. Uh, we are anticipating um, moving from this document camera that I have been using since the start of stream, which is the modern equivalent of a um, transparency projector that if you are of a certain age, uh, you probably saw in school um, uh, where there was a light box underneath and a series of mirrors to project something up onto a screen. This is the modern equivalent of that. Um, not ideally suited to what the stream does, uh, but we are, we've installed some, uh, like a rack that we can hang things from. It's got the lighting on it. It's going to have the main camera for my face, and it's also going to have uh, cameras that I can use for top down and so that I could actually um, hopefully have a more responsive camera, be able to do larger format items, be able to do the smaller format items more reliably so that we can hopefully get entire documents on screen and then zoom into parts of it. Uh, just overall hopeful uh, about some improvements that are coming. Um, oh yes, this is my bad. I forgot to turn on the captions. Um, let us just, uh, uh, get those marbles rolling. Um, I, I didn't look at the chat, and so I didn't see you all screaming at me that I should turn on the captions. Hopefully they're on now, and, uh, you all can see them. I do need to, uh, quickly just, uh, say thank you, Hannah, and was not worth it for your resubscriptions over on the Rogan 27 channel. It is good to see, uh, both of you today. Also, um, it is good to see Lord Portico. Welcome, uh, Key Squared, uh, welcome as well. Um, and Shadows of Life, everybody that's here, uh, on both channels, it's great to have you here. We are going to start with the uh, Land and Labor Acknowledgement. Uh, let me just pull that up on my phone because even though I read it once a week, I don't know it word for word, uh, <laughs> which is why I read it to you instead of trying to recite it from memory because I think it's important and important to accurately state what the university has said on this issue. Um, so let's just go ahead here and uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities through sustained, transparent, 
and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and making, or meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through, through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to utprosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Um, and just because I don't think I've ever taken a moment at the end of that to say, uh, the name of the act that I mentioned, oh my gosh, no, we are not restarting that computer. Um, we're actively using that computer uh, windows. It now's not a good time to restart. Uh, anyway, technology issues rear their, uh, their head again. Anyway, uh, what I was going to say was um, the name of the act that is mentioned in the statement, the Moral Act of 1862, is not moral, M-O-R-A-L, as in morals. It is M-O-R-R-I-L-L, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, uh, the Moral Act of 1862, named for the uh, bill's author. Um, and, and so, just because I say it, uh, you don't necessarily see it spelled out. And so I just thought I'd take at least once to mention that. And then also at the end, um, it mentions utprosim, um, and there's a parenthetical. And I try to convey the parenthetical in voice, but that's hard to do. Anyway, ut pro sim is the school's motto. It means that I may serve. Uh, so just thought a little clarity there at least once would be good. Um, anyway, so what we have today is what we had planned for a month ago. When I was not feeling well and went home early and then I was off work for two weeks and uh, so there were three weeks with no archives stream. And what that is, is a trip to the 19th century uh, to look at some works by um, some women scientists from the 1800s. Uh, what I find, it, so I didn't know about them. This was uh, initially inspired by a request from a viewer I think possibly key squared. It might have been you. Um, and uh, so I, I had to learn a little bit about these scientists because I was not familiar with them. Um, and then I found what we have in our collections, uh, which is a total of six rare books. Um, and, and so we're going to look at them. I have not really opened them. I don't know exactly what's in them. We're gonna discover it together. Um, what I do know, just from some general, like, general web searches, some primer information searches, me trying to make sure I had enough content to fill two hours, uh, identifying additional um, scientists uh, beyond the one that was requested uh, that would fit into a theme. Uh, is that it was the women in science in the 1800s who were doing science and then communicating it to the general public. The men doing science were part of philosophical societies. They were collaborating with one another, having very erudite uh, discussions and uh, really insular academic conversations. It was the women who tried to communicate scientific principles and scientific learning to the general public. And some of these books uh, that we're going to look at today were written with that purpose in mind. So um, yeah, that is, that is the plan. Uh, so first off, we're going to look at Caroline Herschel. Um, let me just read a very brief little primer on Caroline Herschel uh, so that we can 
just know a little bit about her and then we'll look at her book and then I will read uh, each of the three people we're looking at, uh, Herschel, Somerville, and Marset. Um, I'll read just a little brief bit of bio which comes from Wikipedia. Um, and there should be links in the chat that take you to their Wikipedia pages. Wikipedia is great for just basic primer. Um, and that's what we're going to use it for. So uh, Cor Caroline Lucretia Herschel, uh, born 16 March 1750, died 9 January 1848, was a German astronomer whose most significant contributions to astronomy were the discoveries of several comets, including the periodic comet three, uh, 35P Herschel Rigolet, uh, which bears her name. She was the younger sister of astronomer William Herschel, uh, with whom she worked throughout her career. She was the first woman to receive a salary as a scientist and the first woman in England to hold a government position. Uh, there are links uh, for the backup for that statement. I would be curious to explore that statement a little bit further because it says the first woman to receive a salary. I assume they mean in England. Uh, and I assume they mean first woman documented to receive, have received a salary um, as a scientist in England. Uh, so that's a statement that is on Wikipedia that I'd be like, I, I need to dig into the source for that one to be able to really confirm that. Um, she was, it uh, goes on, uh, she was also the first woman to publish scientific findings in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, uh, to be awarded a gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1828, and to be named an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society, 1835, along with Mary Somerville, who is the second person that we're going to look at today. Uh, she was named an honorary member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1838, uh, and the King of Prussia presented her with a gold medal for science on the occasion of her 96th birthday in 1846. Uh, so, scientists from Germany, active uh, involved in the um, British scientific community, and uh, active in astronomy. I'm going to just budge to the side just a little bit because I'm off center and it's easier to move me than it is to move the camera at this moment. So, um, also hi Fluidan. Yeah, hello from Germany. Um, I hope things are, are good over there. I don't know exactly what the mainland is like. I know England's been getting some really hot weather. Um, hopefully you're staying cool there um, on the continent. Let me go ahead. I'm going to switch this over to document focus, and we're going to take a look at the first item that I have pulled for you all, which is uh, an item that I pulled out of our storage. Um, and you can see here the binding on it. Uh, you can see a um, hold slip uh, to transfer slip to bring it from storage. Um, this is an item titled Memoir and Correspondence of Caroline Herschel. Oh gosh, that is way out of focus. I apologize. Uh, we'll just zoom in on that there. Memoir and Correspondence of Caroline Herschel. Um, so when I was looking for Herschel items, I think this was the only one I found. I'm just gonna double check real quick. It's been a month. Uh, I can't remember exactly what I pulled like five weeks ago. Um, so just gonna refresh my memory here and see if I had any other Herschel items before we dive in fully. Also, um, because as I said, these particular scientists are, are relatively new to me, I welcome any information that you might have. Um, I always wel welcome information that you might have. This is, um, uh, this entire stream is tagged as educational. Uh, it is as much educational for me as it is for you. So, um, yeah, hi Crafty Becky. 
Yeah, isn't it? It's a it's a very nice like marbled look on this cover. Um, and and this appears to be probably an original uh, binding or, or cover. I can't be 100% certain it's possible it was rebound at some point, but I don't have any real indications of that. Um, here on the inside, we've got a lovely um, portrait of Caroline Herschel from 1876. Looks like the artist was John Murray. You may have seen that portrait if you saw my, uh, my tweet to promote the stream. I'm probably gonna have to pull out foam for today. The blue and the, the golden, yeah. First woman to receive a salary as a scientist thing. Uh, like I said, that is one that I would wanna dig into. Um, let, me, let me follow the link and we'll see where, they claim, where, where they're pulling that claim from. Um, so there is the reference on that is to a 2004 item by Claire Brock titled Public Experiments. It's from the History Workshop Journal, Oxford University Press. Um, it appears to be a JSTOR item. I don't know if I can get into this easily. Um, and, and so that's the thing, like I would have to, it's, it's a full article. Um, I could probably get the PDF of it, but it is a six page article. Uh, so digging through it to find exactly where they're pulling that claim from, I, I would, would take me time that, um, and, and it's also possible that it could have been the, because there are two references on that. Uh, the other one is to a 1986 uh, article by Marilyn Bailey Ogilvie uh, titled Women in Science Antiquity Through the 19th Century uh, from MIT Press. And so it's one of those two articles um, that they're referencing for it. Um, and so that's something where, like, I'm very curious. I'd love to dig through it, but I'm not going to do it on stream because the focus, is, I, I want the focus to be on the historic documents that I have to share. Um, but in reading the, the general primer information from Wikipedia, I thought it was important to mention, like, hey, that's a very, um, a very forward claim there. I'd want to actually check their source on it. Uh, also, I'm budging this camera too much, sorry. Let me try and get this straightened out. Uh, yeah, so you were thinking Dr. Laura Bassi at Bologna uh, was earlier. So I do think that their claim, I think the way it's written on Wikipedia is potentially a little easy to misunderstand, but I do believe their claim is that she was the first woman in England to receive a salary as a scientist. So um, Laura Bassi at Bologna wouldn't uh, fit that criteria. <laughs> so it, it's entirely possible they're correct. I would just, I, that's one claim that I would wanna dig into. Um, Memoir and Correspondence of Caroline Herschel by Mrs. John Herschel. Uh, Mrs. John Herschel is Caroline Herschel. Uh, with Portraits, second edition, London, uh, 1879. And the publisher is John Murray, Albemarle Street. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a glance at this introduction here and then we'll, I don't know, pick some place at random in the book and see what there is to find out. Um, Familiar to all, as is the name this volume bears. Uh, sorry, this sentence is defeating my mind. 
Familiar to all, as is the name this volume bears, it is not without hesitation that the following pages are given to the world. To subject the memorials of a deeply earnest life to the eyes of a generation overcrowded with books raises a certain amount of diffidence. Of Caroline Herschel herself, most people will plead ignorance without feeling ashamed. And yet, may we not assert that Caroline Herschel is well worth knowing? Great men and great causes have always some helper of whom the outside world knows but little. There always is and always has been some human being in whose life their roots have been nourished. Sometimes these helpers have been men. Sometimes they have been women who have given themselves to help and to strengthen those called upon to be leaders and workers, inspiring them with courage, keeping faith in their own idea alive in days of darkness, when all the world seems adverse to, to desert. I'm not sure if it's dessert or desert, but dessert made more sense. Um, these helpers and sustainers, men or women, have all the same quality in common. Absolute devotion, uh, and honestly, you can't see the spelling because it's behind my head. Uh, I'll shift it over, but it's spelled D-E-S-E-R-T, which I believe is desert, but... I don't know. Sentiment-wise, dessert seemed more appropriate there, but whatever. Uh, these helpers and sustainers, men or women, have all the same quality in common. Absolute devotion and unwavering faith in the individual or in the cause. Seeking nothing for themselves, thinking nothing of themselves, they have all an intense power of sympathy, a noble love of giving themselves for the service of others, which enables them to transfuse the force of their own personality into the object to which they dedicate their powers. Of this noble company of unknown helpers, Caroline Herschel was one. She stood beside her brother William Herschel, sharing his labors, helping his life. In the days when he gave up a lucrative career that he might devote himself to astronomy, it was owing to her thrift and care that he was not harassed by the rankling vexations of money matters. She had been his helper and assistant in the days when he was a leading musician. She became his helper and assistant when he gave himself up to astronomy. By sheer force of will and devoted affection, she learned enough of mathematics and methods of calculation, which to those unlearned seem mysteries, to be able to commit to writing the results of his researches. She became his assistant in the workshop. She helped him to grind and polish his mirrors. She stood beside his telescope in the nights of midwinter to write down his observations when the very ink was frozen in the bottle. She kept him alive by her care. Thinking nothing of herself, she lived for him. She loved him and believed in him and helped him. With all her heart and with all her strength, she might have become a, distingu a distinguished woman on her own account, for with the seven-foot Newtonian sweeper given to her by her brother, she discovered eight comets first and last. But the pleasure of seeking and finding for herself was scarcely tasted. She minded the heavens for her brother. She worked for him, not for herself. And the unconscious self-denial which, with which she gave up her own pleasure in the use of her sweeper is not the least beautiful feature in her life. She must have been witty and amusing to judge from her books of recollections. When past 80, she wrote what she called Quote, a little history of my life from 1772 to 1778, unquote, for her nephew, Sir John Herschel, the son of her brother William, that he might know something of his excellent grandparents as well as of the immense difficulties which his father had to surmount in his life and labors. It was not to tell about herself, but of others, that she wrote them. There is not any good biography of Sir William Herschel, and the incidental revelations of him in these recollections are valuable. They show how well he deserved the love and devotion she rendered to him. Great as were his achievements in science and his genius, they were borne up and ennobled by the beauty and worth of his own inner life. These memorials of his father and his aunt 
were much valued by Sir John Herschel, and they were carefully preserved by the family along with her letters. The perusal of them is like reading of another world. The glimpses of the life of a soldier's family in Hanover at the time the Seven Years' War was going on are very touching. Both father and mother must have been remarkable persons, and the sterling quality of character developed in William and Caroline Herschel was evidently derived from them. All the family seemed to have been endowed with something like touches of genius, but William and Caroline were the only two who had the strong backbone of perseverance and high principle which made genius in them fulfill its perfect work. Her own recollections go back to the great earthquake in Lisbon. She lived through the American War, the old French Revolution, the rise and fall of Napoleon, and all manner of lesser events and wars. She saw all the improvements and inventions from the lumbering post wagon in which she made her first journey from Hanover to the railroads and electric telegraphs which have intersected all Europe, for she lived well down into the region of Victoria. But her work of minding the heavens with her brother engrossed all her thoughts, and she scarcely mentions any public event. Her own astronomical labors were remarkable, and in her later life she met with honor and recognition from learned men and learned societies. But her dominant idea was always the same. I am nothing. I have done nothing. All I am, all I know, I owe to my brother. I am only the tool which he shaped to his use. A well-trained puppy dog would have done as much. Every word said in her own praise seemed to be so much taken away from the honor due to her brother. She had lived so many years in companionship with a truly great man and in the presence of, an unfathomable, of the unfathomable depths of the starry heavens that praise of herself seemed childish exaggeration. The letters and recollections contained in this volume will show what she really was. She would have been very angry if she could have foreseen their publication, yet in consideration of the great interest they possess, we hope to be justified for making known to the world such an example of self-sacrifice and perseverance under difficulties. The spelling has been modernized. An old lady who had discovered eight comets might be allowed to spell in her own way, but it is pleasanter to read what is written in an accustomed manner. A word has been altered occasionally where the sense required it other... Uh, where the sense required it, otherwise no change has been made, and as little has been added as was possible, and only with the view of giving a slight connecting thread of narrative. If these recollections convey as much pleasure to the readers of them as they have given to the editor, they will feel that they have gained another friend in Caroline Lucretia Herschel. December, 1875. Note, when past 90, a second memoir was undertaken, and in order uh, to encourage her to continue it, her niece, Lady Herschel, wrote to her as follows. Now, my dearest aunt, you must let me make an earnest petition to you, and that is that you will go on with your memoir until you leave England and take up your residence in Hanover. How can I tell you how much my heart is set upon the accomplishment of this work? You know you cannot be idle while you live, but indeed if I could tell you the influence which a short account by a stranger of your labors with your dear brother had upon me when a child, and of my choosing you, then so unknown to me as my guiding star and example, you would understand how the possession of such a record by your own hand would make me almost believe in auguries and presentiments, and perhaps inspire some future generations more worthily, as the record would be more genuine. August 9th, 1841. May we not echo this hope, and feel indeed that she being dead yet speaketh? Uh, that was the introduction which I find very interesting, and oh my gosh, I, I apologize for um, the sudden movement of the camera there as my foot caught the cord uh, hanging off the side of the table. Um, incidentally, I'm loving uh, one of the new pieces of the setup here, which is um, I have a monitor on the other side, on the wall of the, the room, that lets me see uh, what's going out. It, it's slightly delayed from my actual actions, but faster than what you all see. Um, 
And it means that I can see the document up there, and up there is behind the camera, and so I can look at the camera while I'm reading to you. And I'm loving that. The only thing I wish is that the camera were lower, so that I could see the screen without the camera in the middle of it. But that's something for next week, because that can be adjusted. Um, hi, Stephen. Uh, so let's look at the table of contents here. Life in Bath. I can take a look at Life in Bath. We can, we can read about Life in Bath. Um, let's see. Uh, so chapter one is fan early life in Hanover, musical talents of her brother, William, marriage of her sister, the regiment ordered to England, her father's industry, typhus fever, confirmation, death of father, uh, accompanies William to England. Chapter two, Life in Bath. Uh, Heimve? I'm not certain on the pronunciation of that. The Mighty Telescope. That sounds promising. The Mighty Telescope. The Last Performance in Public. Casting the Great Mirror. That sounds promising. Uh, William Herschel Goes to London. Made Royal Astronomer. Removal to Datchet. Accidents. Grant of 2,000 pounds. Life at Slow. Uh... Letters from Hanover and Discovery of a Comet. Chapter two sounds amazing. Uh, uh, chapter three, William, Herth William Herschel's marriage, discovery of the eighth comet, extracts from day book and diary, visit to Bath, return to Slough, uh, resides at Upton, illness, fear of blindness. And then there's a bunch of uh, deaths and travel in chapter four. Chapter five, her humility made honorable member of the Royal Astronomical Society. I think chapter two is, is where to focus our attentions um, for Caroline Herschel here. Um, that, that seems the most promising. Heimve means homesick. Huh, okay. I'm also not certain that I'm pronouncing uh, slow correctly, but um, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I, everything I read on this stream is sight reading, um, which, because I've, I've not looked at these things before. Um, and so uh, I do my best. I haven't had a chance to prepare in advance and learn what the pronunciations actually are. Sorry. Something odd in the other streams chat. Uh, let, okay, so we have an illustration of a Sir William Herschel's 40 foot telescope at Slow. I assume that's how it's said. Yeah, that's the telescope. Uh, chapter two Life of the Brother and Sister in Bath. You were wondering who needed a house cannon? Uh, nope, telescope. I should have a, I do have a weighted pillow. That will be very helpful. Um, and just to show you the archival tools that I am using, I just put one of these on, on the book. It's just like a little, um, tiny little pillow filled with like coarse sand. Uh, like very small rocks, um, which according to Monty Python float on water, um, or weighs less than a duck's, uh, a duck. But uh, anyway, uh, used to, you know, hold the book open so that I don't have to have my hand on there holding it open the entire time. Um, it is on wheels. Uh, the small wheels that you see there would be so that it can rotate 
and view different parts of the sky. Um, it, so it's basically those wheels run along that track so it can rotate in a circle. Um, Life of the Brother and Sister in Bath. At the time when William Herschel brought his sister back to him, or back with him to Bath, he had established himself there as a teacher of music, numbering among his pupils many ladies of rank. Uh, he was also organist of the Octagon Chapel and frequently composed anthems, chants, and whole services for the choir under his management. Uh, and there, come on, skip ahead to what Catherine was involved in. <laughs> That's what I care about on this stream. Uh, So basically, he worked on music professionally so that he could do his science, is what I'm gathering from this page. I'm going to skip ahead and see if we can find out more about um, Catherine, or, or Caroline, not Catherine, Caroline herself. Um, because the focus is on her, and I don't want to get lost in reading about her brother. Yep, yep, yep. I understand these are recollections and things. All right, we have some letters. Those seem promising. Or at least more promising. Uh, dear Lena, I have had an audience of His Majesty this morning and met with a very gracious reception. I presented him with the drawing of the solar system and had the honor of explaining it to him and the Queen. Uh, my telescope is in three weeks' time to go to Richmond and meanwhile to be put up at Greenwich, where I shall accordingly carry it today. So you see, Lena, that you must not think of seeing me in less than a month. I shall write to Miss Lee myself uh, and other scholars who inquire for me. You may tell that I cannot wait on them till His Majesty shall be pleased to give me leave to return or rather to dismiss me, for till then I must attend. I will also write to Mr. Palmer to acquaint him with it. Uh, so, I mean, it's a letter from William Herschel, but also just also, wow, the telescope uh, being installed at uh, Greenwich. That's a big deal. I'm, I'm going to look for one that's actually maybe written by her or something. This is the problem with me not reviewing these things ahead of time, or at least one that's written to her. How about that? Uh, I assume so as well, Simsilica. I don't know. I would need to look particularly into the design of the Herschel telescope. Um, I'm sure there are engineering drawings. I'm sure there's information out there on how the Herschel telescope worked. Um, it's possible that there was some sort of gear system, uh, given that this was in the 1800s. Um, and it wa was work that was associated with the uh, Royal Society and the Royal Astronomical Society. It's possible that it had sufficient funding to have the sort of construction. Um, there was sufficient knowledge of horology in England at the time for them to have complicated gearing systems, uh, horology being um, uh, uh, clock making watchmaking, that type of stuff. Uh, so gear mechanisms that could turn a structure of that size by um, pumping pedals or turning uh, a wheel inside the structure were certainly possible. But I'm, I, I don't know exactly how it was uh, constructed. Um, 
The two following short letters were carefully preserved, and though they contain nothing of importance, they are of interest as being of the very few from the same pen which are not on scientific subjects. No! Not on scientific subjects! Okay, no, I'm not... I want to find the part about the first comet. All right, so this, this part is, the heading says life and work at slow. The next one says the first comet. That is, is what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the comets. I want to focus on the stuff that Caroline Herschel actually did. Boy. Who knew it would be this hard? Uh, Miss Herschel to Dr. Bl uh, Blagden, August 2nd, 1786. Wow, back into the 18th century. Uh, sir, in consequence of the friendship which I know to exist between you and my brother, I venture to trouble you in his absence with the following imperfect account of a comet. The employment of writing down the observations when my brother uses the 20-foot reflector does not often allow me time to look at the heavens. But as he is now on a visit to Germany, I have taken the opportunity to sweep in the neighborhood of the sun in search of comets. And last night, the 1st of August, about 10 o'clock, I found an object very much resembling in color and brightness the 27 nebula of the... Uh, Connaissance de Tamps, uh, with the difference, however, of being round. I don't know what the, the Connaissance de Tamps, de Tamps is. Uh, let me look it up. Uh, C-O-N-N-O-I-S-S. -S. I don't type fast when I'm typing uh, one-handed. The uh, Connaissance des Temps, uh, in English, Knowledge of the Times, is an official yearly publication of astronomical ephemerides in France. Until just after the French Revolution, the title appeared as uh, Connaissance des Temps, uh, spelled differently, sorry. And for several years, different names. So, huh. apparently still in publication. Uh, since 1984, it has been under the title, uh, uh, it's in French, um, Ephemerides uh, Astronomiques Annuaire du Bureau de Longitude. And I'm sure my French pronunciation is very bad. I took French in fifth grade, and I haven't taken it since. So it's been a long time since I studied any French. Uh, <laughs> horology has an interesting etymology. I've never looked into the etymology of that word. Um, anyway, uh, so very much resembling in color and brightness, the 27 nebula um, from that publication, with the difference, however, of being round. I suspected it to be, to be a comet, but a haziness coming on, it was not possible to satisfy myself as to its motion till this evening. I made several drawings of the stars in the field of view with it, and have enclosed a copy of them with my observations annexed, that you may compare them together. August 1, 1786, uh, 9H 50 degrees, 9 hours 50 minutes, sorry. Um, figure 1, the object in the center is like a star out of focus, while the rest are perfectly distinct, and I suspect it to be a comet. 10 hours 33 minutes, figure 2, the suspected comet makes now a perfect isosceles triangle with the two stars A and B. 11 hours, 8 minutes. I think the situation of the comet is now as in figure 3, but it is so hazy that I cannot sufficiently see the small star B to be assured of the motion. 
Sadly, we don't seem to have the figures reproduced in this publication. I'm very sad about that, actually. By the naked eye, the comet is bet between the 54 and 53 Ursa Majoris, or Ursae Majoris, and the 14, 15, and 16 Come uh, Berenices, Berenice, Berenices. Come Berenices. I'm not familiar with that one. Um, uh, I guess those are three stars um, that I just don't recognize the name of. Uh, it makes an obtuse triangle with them, the vertex of which is turned toward the south. August 2nd, 10 hours, 9 minutes. The comet is now, with respect to the stars A and B, situated as in figure 4. Therefore, the motion since last night is evident. 10 hours, 30 minutes, another considerable star, C, may be taken into the field with it by placing A in the center when the comet and the other star will be. Uh, will both appear in the circumference, as in figure 5. These observations were made with a Newtonian sweeper of 27-inch focal length and a power of about 20. The field of view is uh, 2 degrees 12 minutes. I cannot find the stars A or C in any catalog, but suppose they may easily be traced in the heavens, whence the situation of the comet, as it was last night at 10 hours 33 minutes, may be pretty nearly ascertained. You will do me the favor of communicating these observations to my brother's astronomical friends. I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient, humble servant, Carolina Herschel. August 2nd, 1786, Slow, near Windsor. Hero coming from aura, meaning hour. Oh, horo coming from aura, meaning hour. Oh, that makes sense, actually, etym etymologically speaking. So that was an interesting letter of just, like, sending her observations and asking them to be passed along. Um, I just... This is her claiming ownership over discovering this comet, and I just... 1786. Uh, a woman... Writing this knowledgeably about science and being able to just write to people and actually get the credit for it. Like, I have no doubt that women knew enough to be able to speak articulately about these things and um, as was put forward in the introduction to this work, um, quite often they served as assistance to the people that got the credit. Um, so the fact that she's writing and actually gets the credit for having discovered the comet is what's uh, unique and interesting here. I'm going to read one more here, uh, one more letter from her. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll finish out. There's a couple of pages of letters about the first comet. That's what we'll read. And then um, there are five other books to look at uh, about the two other um, women scientists, and so we'll probably will read about the first comet of the eight that she discovered, and then we'll move on to Mary Somerville, because uh, I don't want to get um, so focused on uh, Carolina Herschel or Caroline Herschel that we don't get to the other two, um, which would be very easy for me to do. Uh, Miss Herschel to Alex Aubert, Esquire, Slow, August 2nd, 1786. Dear Sir, August 1st, in the evening at 10 o'clock, I saw an object very much resembling, in color and brightness, the 27 of Mr. Messier's nebulae. Except this object being round. I suspected it to be a comet, but a haziness came on before I could convince myself of, it having mo of its having moved. I made several figures of the objects in the field, whereof I take the liberty to send the first that you might compare it with what I saw tonight. In figure one, I observed the nebulous spot in the center, a bright red but small star upwards, another very faint white star following, and in the situation as marked in the figure, there is a third star preceding but exceedingly faint. I suspected several more, which may perhaps appear in a finer evening, but they were not distinct enough to take account of. In figure two, August 2nd, are only the red and its uh, following star. The preceding in figure one is partly hid, in the rays of the comet, and by one or two glimpses I had, I think it is got before it. 
uh, in figure three, I took the comet in the edge by way of taking in the assistance of another star of about the same size and color as that in the center. The only stars I can possibly see with the naked eye, uh, which might be of service to point out the place of the comet, are 53 and 54 Ursa, uh, Ursa Major, uh, from which it, had, it is about an equal distance with the 14, 15, and 16 Come Ber, uh, Berceris, which um, was mentioned in the previous letter, uh, and makes an obtuse angle with them. I think it must be about one degree above the parallel of the 15 Come. Um, I made these observations with my little Newtonian sweeper and used a power of about 30. The field is about one and one half degree. I hope, sir, you will excuse the trouble I give you with my wag. Uh, there's a clarification added here, meaning vague description, uh, which is owing to my being a bad, or what is better, no observer at all. For these last three years, I have not had an opportunity to look as many hours in the telescope. Lastly, I beg of you, sir, if this comet should not have been seen before, to take it under your protection in regard to AR and DC. Oops, all Herschels, no! Uh, <laughs> that would mean we spent an entire episode on one book, which technically we've done, but I had seven editions of that book. So anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> With my respectful compliments to the ladies, your sisters, I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient, humble servant, Caroline Herschel. Uh, and then we have a letter from Dr. Bladgen to Miss Herschel. Uh, Gower Street, Bedford Square, August 5th, 1786. Madam, Mr. Aubert's letter, as well as that with which you favored me, both arrived safe. The evening was fine on Thursday, but Mr. Aubert has prevented, or was prevented from going to Lone Pit Hill, and I have no opportunity of making astronomical observations here, so that I believe the comet has not yet been seen by anyone in England but yourself. Yesterday, the visitation of the Royal Observatory at Greenwich was held, where most of the principal astronomers in and near London attended, which afforded an opportunity of spreading the news of your discovery, and I doubt not, but many of them will verify it in the next clear night. I also mentioned it in a letter to Paris, and in another I had occasion to write to Munich in Germany. If the weather should be favorable on Sunday evening, uh, it is not impossible that Sir Joseph Banks and some friends from his house may wait upon you to beg the favor of viewing this ph phenomenon through your telescope. Accept my best thanks for your obliging attention in communicating to me the news, and believe me to be, with great esteem, your obedient, humble servant, C. Bladgen. So much, you know, decorum and respect in, in, uh, in speaking to her. She's clearly someone who is respected within the circles, um, or at least on paper and when addressing her directly. Uh, your obedient servant, see her? Oh, Lord Portico. You may need more coffee. I mean, coffee remains your obedient and humble servant. Um, Alex Aubert, Esquire, to Miss Herschel, London, 17th, or 17th, 7th August, 1786. Dear Miss Herschel, I am sure you have a better opinion of me uh, than to think I have been ungrateful for your very, very kind letter of the 2nd August. You will have judged I wished to give you some account of your comet before I answered it. I wish you joy most sincerely on the discovery. I am more pleased than you can well conceive that you have made it, and that and I think I see your wonderfully clever and wonderfully amiable brother uh, upon the news of it shed a tear of joy. You have immortalized your name, and you deserve such a reward from the being who has ordered all these things to move as we find them. Well, oh, sorry, I... This is a, a um, scientific person's uh, 
assertion that someone deserves rewards from God uh, in a way that I've not seen before. Uh, so anyway, you have immortalized your name and you deserve such a reward from the being who has ordered all these things to move as we find them for your assiduity in the business of astronomy and for your love for so celebrated and so deserving a brother. I received your very kind letter about the comet on the 3rd, but have not been able to observe it till Saturday the 5th, owing to cloudy weather. I found it immediately by your directions. It is very curious and in every respect as you describe it. I have compared it to a fixed star on Saturday night and Sunday night. You see, it travels very fast at the rate of 2 degrees 10 minutes per day and moves but little in NPD. I don't know what NPD means. Um, these observations were made with an equatorial micrometer of Mr. Smeaton's, uh, Mr. Smeaton's construction, which your brother must recollect to have seen at Lone Pit Hill. I need not tell you that meridian observations with my transit instrument and mural quadrant must have been much more accurate. I give you a little figure of its appearance last night and the preceding night upon the scale of Flamsteed's Atlas uh, Celestis. Here follows the sketch figure. By the above, you will see it, will, it will be very near 19 of uh, Come Berens. Berenices, uh, I don't know why I stumble on that every time. And it will be a curious observation if it should prove an occultation of one of the stars of the Come. Uh, notice has been given to astronomers at home and abroad of the discovery. I shall continue to observe it and will give you by and by a further account of it. In the meanwhile, believe me to be with much gratitude and regard, dear Miss Herschel, your most obedient and obliged humble servant, Alex Aubert. I love the sign-offs in the uh, late 18th century here. Um, they seem to just keep getting longer. Oh, we have a postscript. I was glad to hear today by my friends at our club that they had seen you last night in good health. Pray let me know what news you have of your brother and when we may expect to see him. I have had twice at Lone Pit Hill His Serene Highness the Duke of Saxe Gotha and entertained him Count Bruhl and Mr. Oriani, a Milanese astronomer, uh, with your comment last night. My sisters return you many thanks for your kind remembrance and with their best compliments and join me to wish you joy. That's, my sisters uh, say thanks for saying hi to them and uh, that they hope that you're doing good. Um, but wow, we should end streams that way. Yeah, uh, I am, as always, dear chat, your most obedient and humble, humble servant. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be a good sign off indeed. Uh, let's see. Miss Herschel to Dietrich Herschel. Uh, slow, August 4th, 1786. Uh, Dear brother, we received yesterday William's and Alexander's letter and find that they intend to leave Hanover on the 8th of August. Therefore, they will not see the contents of this. However, as you have an instrument, I think you are entitled to information of a telescopic comet, which I happened to discover on the 1st of August, and which I found by the observations of the 2nd to have moved nearly three quarters of a degree. Last night it was cloudy, but I hope the weather will be more favorable another night, that we may see more of it. I believe you have a pair of Harris's maps. Uh, the place where I saw the comet is between 53 and 54 Ursae Major, and the 1415 and 16 Comae, I'm not going to stumble on that one again, of Flamsteed's catalog. All stars of Flamsteed are in uh, Bode's Cat to be found, and if you cannot do without it, I dare say it is to be met with at, at Hanover. I found it with a magnifier of about 30, with a field of about one and a half degree. Now, if you have a piece which is nearly like this, I would advise you to make use of that in sweeping all, all around this place, for it must be, by the time you receive this letter, at a considerable distance. When I saw it, it appeared like a very bright but round small nebula. The first letter I received from Hanover from William gave us the, great satisfaction the greatest satisfaction imaginable, for it contained an account of the good health of 
all our dear relations. I hope our dear mother does not grieve too much now they have left her. I dare say William will soon will pay soon another visit, and then I will take the opportunity of coming to see her. Farewell, dear brother, and uh, give my best love, etc. Uh, to this period of Miss Herschel's life belongs a folio manuscript book. Uh, sorry, that's going into um, the next topic in the um, the book of remembrances here, which is uh, employments at Slow and. Um, that's where I said we would stop and move on to Mary Somerville. <laughs> Please join with me in liking and subscribing. Yes, very much so. <laughs> um, it's just very flowery language. It's not what we're used to here today, but it is, um, it, it, which is why it sounds so flowery. Um, if you read letters from the 80s, they also sound overly done compared to today. Oh, that's interesting. The, the camera's like pulsing. I don't understand and I apologize. Um, it's less noticeable if I take the foam away. Uh, oh, Lord Portico, thank you for the hydrate redeem. I will indeed hydrate. And then I'm, I'm going to uh, read a brief Hang on, let me, let me drink the water first. Okay, so as you can see this next volume, uh, Personal Recollections of Mary Somerville, which I'm sorry, that is gonna be really out of focus, but um, ah, Personal Recollections of Mary Somerville, it's inside a box, uh, which generally means it, probably in um, somewhat more fragile condition. Oh yeah. Oh wow. We'll, we'll explore that in a moment. Uh, first I need to tell you who Mary, Som Mary Somerville is. Uh, so you know why we're looking at her stuff. Um, and then I will show you the archivalness. Um, Mary Somerville. And, and I don't know if you want to see my face bigger, but we'll, we'll zoop over here. Uh, Mary Somerville. Nay, Fairfax, formerly Grieg. Uh, 26 December 1780 to 29 November 1872. Was a Scottish scientist, writer, and polymath. She studied mathematics and astronomy, and in 1835, she was elected, together with Caroline Herschel, as the first female honorary members of the Royal Astronomical Society. When John Stuart Mill, the philosopher and economist, organized a massive petition to Parliament to give women the right to vote, he had Somerville put her signature first on the petition. When, or sorry, in 1834, she became the first person to be described in print as a scientist. I'm very curious about that. Uh, uh, the citation on that is an article from January 3rd, 2019 by Hamish McPherson uh, titled, Back in the Day, the Queen of Science Behind Scotland's 10-Pound Note, uh, published in The National. Um, so that is the published source that makes the claim that she was the first person to be described in print as a scientist. Uh, when she died in 1872, the Morning Post declared in her obituary that whatever difficulty we might experience in the middle of the 19th century in choosing a king of science, there could be no question whatever as to the queen of science. Uh, Somerville College, a college in the or a college of the University of Oxford is named after her, reflecting the virtues of liberalism and academic success which the college wished to embody. She is featured on the front of the Royal Bank of Scotland's polymer 10 pound note launched in 2017, alongside a quotation from her work on the connection of the physical sciences. Uh, so I have a couple of items from Mary Somerville. 
Uh, let me go ahead and we'll switch back over to the document focus here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have two items from Mary Somerville. Uh, the first one is in this box. And um, this box itself has aged. As you can see, the little Velcro dots that are supposed to hold it closed. You can't see because it's out of focus. Uh, the little Velcro dots that are supposed to hold it closed, the adhesive on them has thoroughly dried out and they are no longer um, sticking as they should. Uh, the book is tied up with some cotton string and it has what appears to be tape. Like, it appears to have clear packing tape added to reinforce the binding, um, which is not standard archival practice. Uh, the, the cotton tape, standard. We, we do that on lots of things. Generally would prefer not adding adhesives. Um, especially because uh, while this has not aged enough for that uh, the clear tape to become gross, over time it's going to become really gross. Um, so I, I'm not sure who did that preservation work, but it's also entirely possible that that was done to the book when it was part of the circulating collection uh, in order to make it last longer as part of the circulating collection, and that at some point then it was transferred over into special collections. Um, that is totally a thing that happens. Uh, a bust of Mary Somerville. To start us off. Personal Recollections from Early Life to Old Age of Mary Somerville, with selections from her correspondence by her daughter Martha Somerville, uh, published in Boston by Roberts Brothers in 1874. So this is, once again, going to be, th this is going to be similar to the book that we were just looking at, um, where it's not so much a published item of her works as it is uh, her daughter worked with a publisher to write about her and uh, published some of her letters. Um, so we'll briefly look at this one because the other item that I have is a copy of The Connection of the Physical Sciences, which is the work that is quoted on the Scottish 10 pound note. Um, yeah, I think it was just part of uh, Virginia Tech's main library collection and then eventually transferred over um, and my guess would be that that taping I mean, that taping is is actually a method that would be used uh, and would have been used in a circulating collection like a just a general library collection to prolong the life of a book that they're not wanting to buy another copy of right now but that gets enough use and it's deteriorating and it's just like will hold it together. Um, but then at some point, this became an important enough item to transfer into special collections. Um, so a, basically really similar to the previous one, I'm gonna skim the contents here. Uh, introduction, parentage, life in Scotland in the last century, early education, school, last century being not, not our last century, but the century previous, wow. Actually, no. Here, they're referring to the 1700s as last century. A freedom, religious education, Jedburg, Edinburgh. Oh, sorry, I guess that'd be Jedburgh. Now I'm having to adjust for Scottish pronunciations. Great, thanks. No. <laughs> uh, uh, youthful studies and amusements, politics, the theaters of the time. Edinburgh supper parties, uh, tour in the Highlands, mutiny in the fleet, battle of Camperdown, first marriage, 1804, widowhood, studies, second marriage, 
Somerville family, Dr. Somerville's character, letters, journey to the lakes, death of Sir William Fairfax, and reminiscences of Sir Walter Scott. Uh, life in Hanover Square, visit to France, Arago, Cuvier, Rome, uh, education of daughters, Dr. Wollaston, Dr. Young, the Herschels, society in London, coronation of George IV, letter to Dr. Somerville, uh, death of Margaret Somerville, letter from Mrs. Somerville to the Reverend Dr. Somerville, life at Chelsea, the Napiers, Maria Edgeworth, tour in Germany. A uh, letter from Dr. Brogum. I'm really uncertain on pronunciation of that name. Uh, astronomy, geology, microscopy. Yeah, she was a polymath and she did, she, she was amazing. Um, let's see, notice in the Academy de Sciences and uh, I'm hoping for something concise or I might just flip to a page. Chapter Chapter 16 is a possibility. Although not the section on vivisection. Uh, cholera Misericordia Comet All right. Eruption of Vesuvius, Aurora Borealis. Some of the topics in here are just, but I have no idea what's going to be there, um, which is part of the fun, but also like, I look at the clock and I'm like, I don't have lots of time. Okay, I'm really curious about the, um, the entry on Eruption of Vesuvius. So we're going to go there. Unless you saw something that you particularly want me to see what it was. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious, like, what's in here about the eruption of Vesuvius? Uh, starting somewhere after 329. Let's see. Microscopic science on board a flagship. Garibaldi. Italian servants. I don't, I don't usually say Italian that way. I don't know why I said Italian. Uh, Spezia. Eruption of Vesuvius. Um, okay, let's just see here. Sometime after this, my widowed daughter-in-law spent a few months with us. On her return to London, I sent the manuscript of the molecular and microscopic science with her for publication. In writing this book, I made a great mistake and repented. Mathematics are the natural bent of my mind. If I had devoted myself exclusively to that study, I might probably have written something useful, as a new era had begun in that science. Although I got um, Kalis on the higher geometry, I, I'm really uncertain on that pronunciation. Uh, it could be but a secondary object while I was engaged in writing a popular book. Subsequently, it became a source of deep interest and occupation to me. Uh, Spitzia is very much spoilt by the works in progress for the arsenal. Though nothing can change the beauty of the gulf as seen from our windows, especially the group of the Carrera Mountains, with fine peaks and ranges of hills becoming more and more verdant down to the water's edge, the effect of the setting sun on this group is varied and brilliant beyond belief. Even I, in spite of my shaking hand, resumed the brush and painted a view of the ruined castle of Ostia at the mouth of the Tiber from a sketch of my own for my dear friend Teresa Doria. We now came to live at Naples, and on leaving Spitzia, I spent a fortnight with Count and Countess uh, Usedom at the Villa Cap uh, Caponi near Florence, where, though unable to visit, I had the pleasure of seeing my Florentine friends again. We spent two days in Rome and dined with our friends, the Duca and Duchessa, uh, di Sermonetta. Uh, we were grieved at his blindness, but found him as agreeable as ever. Though our friend Admiral Acton, or through our friend Admiral Acton, uh, I became acquainted with Professor Pancheri, Professor of Comparative Anatomy, Signore di uh, Gasparis, who had discovered nine of the minor planets and is an excellent math mathematician, and some others. To these gentlemen, I am indebted 
for being elected an honorary member of the Acade uh, Academia uh, Pontoniana. Uh, we were much interested in Vesuvius, which for several months was in a state of great activity. At first, there were only volumes of smoke and some small streams of lava, but these were followed by the most magnificent projections of red hot stones and rocks rising 2,000 feet above the top of the mountain. Many fell back again into the crater, but a large portion were thrown in fiery showers down the sides of the cone. At length, these beautiful eruptions of Lapili ceased, and the lava flowed more abundantly. Though being intermittent and always in issuing from the summit, it was quite harmless. Volumes of smoke and vapor rose from the crater and were carried by the wind to a great distance. In sunshine, and contrast was beautiful. Uh, in sunshine, the contrast was beautiful between the jet black smoke and the silvery white clouds of vapor. At length, the mountain returned to apparent tranquility. Uh, though the violent detonations occasionally heard gave warning that the calm might not last long. At last, one evening in November 1868, when one of my daughters and I were observing the mountain through a very good telescope lent us by a friend, we distinctly saw a new crater burst out of the foot of the cone in the Atrio del Cavallo, and bursts of red-hot lapilli and red smoke pouring forth in volumes. Early next morning, we saw a great stream of lava pouring down to the north of the observatory, and a column of black smoke issuing from the new craters, because there were two, and assuming the well-known appearance of a pine tree. The trees on the northern edge of the lava were already on fire. The stream of lava very soon reached the plain, where it overwhelmed fields, vineyards, and houses. It was more than a mile in width and 30, deep, 30 feet deep. My daughters went up the mountain the, the evening after the new craters were formed. As for me, I could not risk the fatigue of such an excursion, but I saw it admirably from our own windows. During the year, the volcanic forces in the interior of the earth were in unusual activity, for a series of earthquakes shook the west coast of South America for more than 2,500 miles, by which many thousands of, inhabit of the inhabitants perished, and many more were rendered homeless. I'm going to stop there because I, I do want to move on to the next book. But um, so essentially she was traveling. She was in Italy and they witnessed an eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which she describes expertly. Like um, clearly someone who is trained in how to do description and observation uh, is what I take away from that. The description of the uh, eruption and the experience overall and all is is excellent. I'm very happy with with her writing there. Um, but even though it wasn't particularly like a science that she was working on, she wasn't working particularly in geology or in uh, earthquake science or all volcanism or anything like that. She was just there, like visiting the region and. Uh, it happened to be erupting. She was using scientific terminology to describe the eruption and equating it with uh, a prevalence of earthquakes um, as far away as South America. So it's just um, clearly very intelligent and, and uh, experienced in communicating description of scientific phenomena. Um, all the science. Familiar complaint today. Balancing the time spent on education and outreach versus research, indeed. So this is an actual work by Mary Somerville. <laughs> we have reached something actually written by them instead of about them, which um, I'm thankful for. The connection of the physical sciences by Mrs. Somerville, and someone has penciled in here, comma, Mary, and in uh, parentheses, Fairfax. Um, <laughs> published in Philadelphia by Key and Biddle in 1834. It's embossed? And I don't know what the embossing says. Which to me means the embossing isn't very useful. Ah. It, it's embossed with a stamp that says Virginia Polytechnic Institute 
uh, library, Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, it's the first time I've seen that as, as a means of marking it as property of the library. Uh, so the preface. The progress of modern science, especially within the last five years, has been remarkable for a tendency to simplify the laws of nature and to unite detached branches by general principles. In some cases, identity has been proved where there appeared to be nothing in common, as in the electric and magnetic influences. In others, as that of light and heat, such analogies uh, have been pointed out as to justify the expectation that they will ultimately be referred to the same agent. And in all, there exists such a bond of union that proficiency cannot be attained in any one without a knowledge of others. Although well aware that a far more extensive illustration of these views might have been given, the author hopes that enough has been done to show the connection of the physical sciences. <laughs> it's an issue. You're not a, pro a good professor because you have very little to profess. I thought your job was to um, badger students with challenging legal questions and uh, scare them into um, answering uh, as though they were being circled by sharks uh, while giving an answer that articulates the law without committing to one specific position. Or is that not what a law professor does? <laughs> I tease. Um, let's see what we've got. I'm, I'm going to jump to just a random spot and we're gonna take a look. Oh, wow. Um, these pages are not pliable. Uh, these pages are very rigid. This book has suffered from humidity damage and it has, um, you can see the spotting on the pages here. Uh, and so the pages are They're, they're rigid. They don't bend the way that we expect um, book pages to bend. Uh, and that's a result of the, the water damage. Um, so I'm going to use the foam. Uh, I mean, it's not in terrible condition. And, and any sort of um, mildew that was present has been mitigated. It's all been dried out. It's dead. Um, but it just means that the, the pages are... They don't, they're not as pliable, they're not as flexible as, as we would expect them to be. Um, so I just have to be more careful. Uh, let's look at section six. No idea what section six is. There was no table of contents. Uh, so I'm just gonna start reading and we'll see what we find. Um, <laughs> yes, that's just the teaching. Professing means having opinions on things in public. Gross. Um, yeah, I agree, except that I, I do a lot of professing on the stream. Um, our constant companion, the moon, uh, next claims our attention. Several circumstances concur to render her, motiv uh, her motions the most interesting and at the same time the most difficult to investigate of all the bodies of our system. In the solar system, planet troubles planet, but in the lunar theory, the sun is the great disturbing cause, his vast distance being compensated by his enormous magnitude. I find it interesting here that a Scottish scientist chooses to gender the moon and sun. Um, I, it's something I would expect in... Uh, like Spanish or French, where the language automatically genders a lot of nouns. We're not talking about an ocean-going vessel here, which tends to get gendered in English. Talking about the moon as her and the sun as him is unusual to me. Um, and just was something I wanted to point out because this is someone who's uh, presumably her first language is English. Um, not guaranteed. I didn't. I didn't look 
that closely at her, the Wikipedia article to see if it listed something, say, like Scots as her native language. Uh, but presumably it was English. Uh, so just, anyway. Uh, so that the motions of the moon are more irregular than those of the planets, and on account of the great ellip uh, ellipticity of her orbit and the size of the sun, the approximations to her motions are tedious and difficult beyond what those unaccustomed to such investigations could imagine. Among the innumerable periodic inequalities to which the moon's motion in longitude is liable, the most remarkable are the ev evection, the variation, and the annual equation. I do not know these terms. I hope they are explained. Hi, Philip. Uh, in German, die, die Sonne is female and der Mond is male. Interesting. That's actually really interesting. I don't actually know what what their genders are in in French or Spanish. I just I would expect them to have gender in French and Spanish because French and Spanish assign gender to nouns quite commonly. Um, English doesn't for as gendered as the English language, at least American English, has become. Uh, to the point where we don't use the default uh, non-binary gender term they um, as ubiquitously as we once did, although it is coming back into fashion much more and should be in much wider use. Um, English tends not to gender nouns for in the same way that other languages do. Um, and English being a Germanic language, it's interesting to me that German does gender the sun and the moon. And, but that those genders are reversed from what we see here. Anyway, it's just a thing that struck me as interesting. And part of this uh, stream is looking at archival items and just seeing what we find interesting. So... Um, yeah. All right. The forces producing the evection diminish the eccentricity of the lunar orbit in conjunction and opposition and augment it in quadrature. I don't know what that word means. I have never encountered quadrature before. I'm going to look up this word. Um, I also don't know what evection means. I was hoping it would be explained. I'll look it up in a second as well. In mathematics, quadrature is a historical term, which means the process of determining area. Still used nowadays in the context of differential equations, where solving an equation by quadrature or reduction to quadrature means expressing its solution in terms of integrals. So I don't feel too bad about not knowing that term since it is an older term uh, but basically it means the calculation of the um, area. Uh, evection is the regular variation in the eccentricity of the moon's orbit around the Earth caused mainly by the sun's attraction. So evection is very specifically a term related to the orbit of the moon. Um, So also, don't feel too bad about not having known that one. Uh, okay, so the forces producing the evection diminish the eccentricity of the lunar orbit in conjunction and opposition and augment it in quadrature. The period of this inequality is less than 32 days. Were the increase and diminution always the same, the evection would only depend upon the distance of the moon from the sun. But its absolute value also varies with her distance from the pedigree or perigee of her orbit. Ancient astronomers who observed the moon solely with a view to the prediction of eclipse, uh, which can only happen in conjunction and opposition where the eccentricity is diminished by the evection, assigned too small value to the ellipticity of her orbit. 
the variation, which is at its maximum when the moon is 45 degrees distant from the sun, vanishes when that distance amounts to a quadrant, and also when the moon is in conjunction and opposition. Consequently, that inequality never could have been discovered from the eclipses, uh, from the eclipses, um, its period is half a lunar month. The annual equation arises from the moon's motion being accelerated when that of the Earth is retarded and vice versa. For when the Earth is in its perihelion, the lunar orbit is enlarged by the action of the Sun, therefore the moon requires more time to perform her revolution. But as the Earth approaches its aphelion, the moon's orbit contracts and less time is necessary to accomplish her motion. Its period, consequently, depends upon the time of the year. In the eclipses, the annual equation combines with the equation of the center of the terrestrial orbit so that ancient astronomers imagined the Earth's orbit to have a greater eccentricity than modern astronomers assigned to it. How we doing? Is everybody following along okay? Does this make perfect sense to everybody? Because I'm a little lost. Uh, this is... I'm, I'm lost, but mostly only because I'm reading aloud. If I took the time to parse these sentences myself, like uh, if I was reading it for myself, I'd be reading much slower um, because it, I would have to take some time to actually digest the sentences and understand what they mean. Um, in reading it aloud for you, I kind of I get the frosting on the top of the sentence without getting the cake underneath. Um, so I'm a little lost because I'm reading it faster than I'm able to parse it. Um, and, th and that happens when I read aloud. Uh, but I do see how this is very much written for a general audience. It is not written for scientific peers. It is written in such a way that an educated person of the time, somebody who's able to read, um, and I mean, it, yes, it's above the level of like, above the reading level of your general newspaper. But an educated person, somebody who's learned a little bit of science uh, or a little bit could read this and follow what she is saying. The phrasing is 18th century, which means that it sounds a bit um, pretentious to how such things would be phrased for general consumption today. Um, but in looking at this and comparing it to other things that I've seen from the 18th century, this is very much written for general consumption. Uh, wait, headaches for everyone? Oh dear. Kind of the same listening. Yeah, you'd have to back up and read again. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so she, she was very much a science communicator. This is, while a small book, like, this is a pocketbook, not a pocketbook as in, like, uh, the meaning of that to mean, like, a wallet. This is a book that is small enough to be carried inside of somebody's purse or inside of, I, I want to switch to the other camera so I can hold it up and you can see, like, the size. Um, it's a small book. It's slightly wider than a modern paperback, but about the same height. It's hardbound, not, not uh, softbound like a paperback novel, but it's about the size of a paperback novel. Um, and that also is a characteristic of it being meant for a general audience rather than uh, an academic audience. Um, it's supposed to be convenient and easy to carry around. And uh, this is equivalent to um, 
a scientist writing a book about science for general consumption today. Uh, when I was curious about physics and string theory, there were books that were this this sort of dense in scientific knowledge. Like, they were work for me to absorb as a layperson, somebody who's not spent years studying physics. But they weren't impossible for me to follow. And, and that's sort of where this sits. Um, but I have three items from our last person. We can always come back to that if, if we choose to. Uh, but I do want to make sure that we spend a little bit of time on Jane Marset uh, before we end the stream. Because, especially because Jane Marset, if I remember correctly, was the particular scientist who uh, a viewer said, hey, you have items from this person. Uh, could you do a stream on them? And I said, let me look and see if I can make a stream out of this. Uh, so, Jane Marset, nay Haldeman. Uh, sorry, one second. I just need to make this bigger because, wow, that text is tiny. Uh, Jane Marset, nay Haldeman. Uh, born 1 January 1769, uh, died 28 June 1858, uh, was an English salonier, salonier, I don't know why they chose to use that word, of Swiss origin. Um, see, because now I have to actually, like, yeah, I know what a salon was. Is this just a fancy word for a woman who attended salons? A salon is a gathering of people held by an inspiring host. Yeah, so basically she's just, uh, they, that sentence literally just says uh, she was an English person of Swiss origin who attended salons uh, and an innovative writer of popular explanatory science books. So, popular explanatory science books, um, which Mary Somerville also did popular explanatory science books. But we'll see. Uh, I, I think I have one of Marset's actual publications here. She also broke ground with Conversations on Political Economy, 1816, which explains the ideas of Adam Smith, Malthus, and David Ricardo. Uh, she was one of 12 children of a wealthy Genevan merchant and banker, Anthony Francis Haldeman, um, and his wife Jane, educated at home with her brothers, studied Latin, chemistry, biology, and history, um, as well as other topics more usual for young ladies in England. Uh, let's see. At 15, her mom died and she took over managing the household and raising her siblings. Her younger brother, William Haldeman, became a director of the Bank of England and a member of Parliament. She also acted as her father's hostess, helping to entertain frequent parties of scientific and literary guests, developed an early interest in painting during a visit to Italy with her father in 1796, and studied with Joshua Reynolds and Thomas Lawrence. Um, her artistic training later enabled her to illustrate her books. Jane was married in 1799 to Alexander Jean Gaspard Marset, a political exile from Geneva, Switzerland, who graduated from medical school at the University of Edinburgh as a physician in 1797. After their marriage, the Marsets continued to live in London. They had four children, one of whom, Francoise Marset, became a well known physicist. Um, skimming now. Um, anyway, here's more important information than, than that general introduction. After helping to read the proofs of one of her husband's books, Marset decided to write her own. She produced expository books on chemistry, botany, religion, and economics under the general title Conversations. In her prefaces, Marset addresses whether such knowledge is suitable for women, 
arguing against objections and stating that public opinion supports her view. So, hopefully there are pictures. It said something about pictures, but uh, I have three items here. Conversations on chemistry, conversations on vegetable physiology, and one that says Blake's virtual philosophy, which I know was related, and I'm going to look at that first. Oh no, I'm so sorry that you missed most of the stream, but I'm very happy that you had a customer. Um, we just got to the Jane Marset stuff. Um, oh, you know, I need to switch it back so that you can see the, the documents. <laughs> My distracto brain. Um, I'm, I'm looking... Uh, conversations on natural philosophy in which the elements of that science are familiarly explained and adapted to the comprehension of young pupils illustrated with plates by the author of Conversations on Chemistry and Conversations on Political Economy improved by appropriate questions from the, for the examination of scholars also by illustrative notes and a dictionary of philosophical terms and title. Uh, so the Reverend J.L. Blake takes credit for this work and never even mentions Jane Marset except to say that it is by the author of Conversations on Chemistry and Conversations on Political Botany or Economy. Political Botany. I don't know why my brain said Political Botany. Political Botany is a really interesting concept though. I'm now going to have to think about that. But yes, the entire title is Conversations on Natural Philosophy in which the elements of that science are familiarly explained and adapted to the comprehension of young pupils illustrated with plates by the author of Conversations on Chemistry and Conversations on Political eco Economy improved by appropriate questions for the examination of scholars, also by illustrative notes, and a dictionary of philosophical terms. And that's not even the longest title that I have run across. Um, in a work from the 1800s. Uh, so this is uh, a copy of the 8th American edition. Uh, we have here an illustration, Blake's improved edition of Conversations on Philosophy. Um, variations of day and night and the seasons is what this illustration is. Political botany, the Wars of the Roses! Um, absolutely, that, that would track very much, T squared. Uh, we should back up to those last couple of astronomy sentences for Hannah. Wait, which astronomy sentences? I don't know what astronomy sentences they were. Yes, improved equals he added a man's name to the front, so now it counts as important. I think so, yeah. Why poppies? Uh, my brain immediately went to science fiction with political botany um, and, and to uh, like the politics of a sentient plant species on Mars. Um, as you can see, this also has uh, some moisture damage to it, although the pages are still pliable. Oh, the one where a couple of old words had to be looked up. Oh, um, that was the stuff uh, from Mary Somerville about the moon. Um, we'll go back to it if, if we manage to. Otherwise, um, it, it will be in the VOD. Um, I, I want to make sure that I have time to look at some stuff from uh, Jane Marset. What to do about kudzu? Political botany. Uh, entirely appropriate, yeah. All right, conversation number eight. Um, and yes, I'm pushing it up and you're getting like the bottom of the page, but that means that I can look there and read. 
uh, instead of looking down at the table, which I just think is better. Next week, I will have the camera lower uh, so that I don't have to do that. But this is the first time I've had that monitor. <clears throat> On the Earth, of the terrestrial globe, of the figure of the Earth, of the pendulum, of the variation of the seasons and of the length of days and nights, of the causes of the heat of summer, of solar, side real and equal or mean time, Mrs. B. As the Earth is the planet in which we are the most particularly interested, it is my intention this morning to explain to you the effects resulting from its annual and diurnal motions. But for this purpose, it will be necessary to make you acquainted with the terrestrial globe. You have not, either of you, I conclude, learnt to you the, the use of the globes? Question mark. Uh, there is an asterisk. I don't know. Oh, aha. I was like, where is the, where is the, the footnote? The earth is of a globular form. For one, the shadow of the earth projected on the moon is an in an eclipse is always circular, which appearance could only be produced by a spherical body. Two, the convexity of the surface of the, of the um, sea is evident. Uh, the mast of an approaching ship being seen before its hull. Three, the North Pole becomes more elevated by traveling northward in proportion to the space passed over. Four, navigators have sailed round the earth and by steering their course continually westward arrived at length at the place from whence they departed. For very succinct explanations as to why uh, the Earth is not flat. Um, <clears throat> Caroline. No, I once indeed learnt by heart the names of the lines marked on the globe, but as I was informed, they were only imaginary divisions they did not appear to me worthy of such attention and were soon forgotten. Mrs. B. You suppose then that astronomers had been at the trouble of inventing a number of lines to little purpose. It will be impossible for me to explain to you the particular effects of the Earth's motion without your having acquired a knowledge of those lines, or of these lines. In plate 8, figure 2, you will find them all delineated, and you must learn them perfectly if you wish to make any proficiency in astronomy. Caroline. I was taught them at so early an age that I could not understand their meaning, and I have often heard you say that the only use of words was to convey ideas. Mrs. B, the names of these lines would have conveyed ideas of the figures they were designed to express, though the use of the, these figures might at that time have been too difficult for you to understand. Childhood is the season when impressions on the memory are most strongly and most easily made. It is the period at which a large stock of ideas should be treasured up, the application of which we may learn when the understanding is more developed. It is, I think, a very mistaken notion that children should be taught, taught such things only as they can perfectly understand. Had you been early made acquaintance, or, uh, had you been early made acquainted with the terms which relate to figure and motion, how much it would have facilitated your progress in natural philosophy? I have been obliged to confine myself to the most common and familiar expressions in explaining the laws of nature, though I am convinced that appropriate and scientific terms would have conveyed more precise and accurate ideas, but I was afraid of not being understood. Emily. Uh, you may depend upon our learning the names of, the, of these lines thoroughly, Mrs. B., but before we commit them to memory, will you have the goodness to explain them to us? Mrs. B., most willingly. This globe or sphere represents the Earth. The line which passes through its center and on which it turns is called its axis, and the two extremities of the axis, A and B, are the poles, distinguished by the names of the North and South Pole. The circle CD, which divides the globe into two equal parts between the poles, is called the equator or equinoctial line. The part, that part of the globe to the north of the equator is the northern hemisphere. That part, of the, uh, that part to the south of the equator, the southern hemisphere. 
The small circle EF, which surrounds the North Pole, is called the Arctic Circle. That GH, which surrounds the South Pole, the Antarctic Circle. I will note, this is all accurate information. None of this is out of date. Yet, there is no reason we can't look at the globe entirely upside down from how it has always been presented to us. There is no reason that the North Pole is up and the South Pole is down. It is merely that that is how it has been drawn for hundreds of years. But there is no reason that it has to be port portrayed that way. There's no reason you can't depict the globe with the South Pole pointing up. Um, there are two intermediate circles between the polar circles and the equator. That to the north, IK, called the Tropic of Cancer. That to the south, LM, called the Tropic of Capricorn. Lastly, the circle LK, which divides the globe into, globe into two equal parts, crossing the equator and extending northward as far as the Tropic of Cancer, and southward as far as the Tropic of Capricorn, is called the ecliptic. The delineation of the ecliptic on the terrestrial globe is not without danger of conveying false ideas, for the ecliptic, as I have said before, as I have before said, is an imaginary circle in the heavens passing through the middle of the zodiac and situated in the plane of the Earth's orbit. Caroline, I do not understand the meaning of the plane of the Earth's orbit. Mrs. B, a plane, or plane, is an even level surface. Let us suppose a smooth, thin, solid plane Cutting the sun through the center. I don't know if the illustration is. I, I don't know where the illustration is. Hang on one second. I feel like at this point, I, I'm giving you a disservice by not showing you the illustration in figure eight. Um, or plate eight, it is. Plate eight. So here we have the illustration of the globe that uh, to which uh, the description was going with all of the lines. We've got North Pole, South Pole, Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, uh, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, the equator or equinoctal line, and then the plane of the ecliptic right here. Hi, dearie. I love the, the dots. You're, you're just slightly concerned about what, what the dots were for. Um, but hopefully nothing that I did, other than, like, speaking truth to the internet. Um, where was I? A plane, or plane, is an even level surface. Let us suppose a smooth, thin, solid plane uh, cutting the sun through the center, extending out as far as the fixed stars and terminating in a circle which passes through the middle of the zodiac. In this plane, the Earth would move in its revolution around the sun, and it is therefore called the plane of the Earth's orbit. And the circle in which this plane cuts the signs of the zodiac is the ecliptic. Let the figure 1, plate 9, represent such a plane. Same conversation about North being up as arbitrary. Yes, we are still having that conversation. All right, here's plate nine, figure one. So uh, let the figure one, plate nine, represent such a plane. S, the sun, E, the earth, with its orbit, and A, B, C, D, the ecliptic, passing through the middle of the zodiac. <clears throat> so S, the sun, in the center. E, the earth, in its orbit. And A, B, C, D uh, are the four points defining the ecliptic passing through the middle of the zodiac. Um, and the illustration is for instructional purposes only. It is not 
accurate in its shape because the Earth does not orbit the sun in a perfect circle. Uh, <laughs> Emily, if the ecliptic relates only to the heavens, why is it described upon the terrestrial globe? Excellent question, Emily! Mrs. B, it is convenient for the demonstration of a variety of problems in the use of the globes. And besides, the oblique, um, oblique, obliquity of this, this circle to the equator is rendered more conspicuous by its being described on the same globe as the obliquity of the ecliptic shows the inclination of the Earth's axis to the plane of its orbit. Oh, weird science. Uh, so, essentially, what is being communicated here? She's, she, the this whole conversation is about orbital mechanics of the Earth around the Sun, um, uh, understanding the globe of the Earth, understanding the different lines of uh, latitude, and um, that last part was about you know why do we show the the plane of the ecliptic, why is that a line that is defined on the globe if it relates only to space? And the answer was defining it on the globe helps you to see that when Earth moves about its orbit along the plane, it does so at an angle to the equator and the north-south line between the poles, um, and that is, so Earth is tilted. It lets you see easier that Earth is tilted, um, which I thought was really cool. Um, we, we don't have a whole lot of time left. I do want to glance at at least one more of these. Jeez, where did the time go? Um, the others that we have, uh, vegetable philosophy, um, just gonna like poke our face in there. Uh, but so this would be a botany related one. And this one has had significant water damage. Um, oh, I was hoping there'd be a section of illustrations in the back. Um, but I did wanna look at conversations in chemistry because it is one of her most famous. Um, you can see the very front page of this has been cut out. Uh, again, this has had some of the same type of water damage as some of the other stuff. Um, and the topics covered in here, we've got general principles, we've got free caloric radiation, we've got combined ca caloric latent heat, we've got uh, the decomposition of water, we've got Voltaic electricity, uh, just electricity in general. Um, alkalis, nit nitrate of potassia, compounds of chlorine, bituminous substances. All right, I'm gonna read the beginning of uh, the section here on, on bituminous substances. Chemistry at this point includes electricity. I mean, yeah, Portico is right. Chemistry technically does still include electricity. Um, in that chemistry discusses electrons and their movements. Um, we've sort of shifted that over into the realm of physics in, in the way that we approach science today, but it does fall within the realm of chemistry. Um, and she was looking more at physical sciences, so uh, <laughs> there's overlap. Mentioning that in faculty meetings leads to turf wars. Um, all right, the name bitumen includes naphtha, which is a word that you will encounter a lot if you read, uh, say, fiction from the early part of the 20th century or back into the 19th century, like naphtha. But it's not something we're very familiar with today. 
Uh, the name bitumen includes naphtha, which has been already noticed, petroleum, and mineral tar. They are very um, viscid fluids bearing a strong resemblance to each other. They are found in many coal districts and by exposure to the air become solid and appear much like common pitch. The bitumens are distinguished by their inflammability. Emily. Common pitch and tar, however, are not mineral substances as they are brought from the, the pine districts where turpentine is prepared. Mrs. B. Turpentine exudes from the growing pine tree, but tar is extracted from the, woody, from the wood by means of heat and consists of the turpentine partially decomposed and mixed with other vegetable products. When the more fluid parts are evaporated by boiling, the tar is converted into pitch. Uh, the difference between them and mineral tar and mineral pitch is not greater than might be expected in substances having the same origin, but obtained by different processes. Uh, asphalium, sometimes called uh, Jew's pitch, is a much purer bitumen than common pitch. It is found on the banks of the Dead Sea and in the islands of Barbados and Trinidad, forming large beds in the earth. Dissolved in spirits of turpentine, it forms a dark-colored varnish much used for some purposes. Articles very similar to most of these bituminous, uh, bitumens may be extracted from pit coal. Caroline, it is no it is no easy thing to believe that the vast beds of pit coal existing in various parts of the world and buried far below the surface of the ground have all originated from vegetable minerals. Wood and coal bear but little resemblance to each other, excepting in the fact that they are both combustible. Um, I wish I had more time. Uh, <laughs> I want... I want to share so much more of this um, because it's it's actually really good. Um, so I am unclear on um, I'm unclear if these are documented conversations that she had with other women scientists or other just women who were interested in learning about science, or if this is just her writing as a science communicator to teach these subjects. I'm not certain, and I would be very curious. Um, I feel like this is not actual conversations that happened and that these are actually just her methods for relating scientific topics in a way that her intended audience will understand them. Um, and in that, she is very much more a... Uh, a science communicator for a general populace than Mary Somerville was. Mary Somerville was a science text written for a general audience. Jane Marset, these conversations, which I, I do encourage you to look into if you find them interesting, you should be able to find copies. They were not... Uh, they did not have low distribution. They were very popular books. Um, so you should be able to find one either at your local library, possibly. Uh, they might be in um, some of the online databases. Um, my brain is not giving me the name right now of... Um, oh, geez. Uh, What's it called? Um, a Project Gutenberg. Um, 
uh, there's a really good chance that some of them have been scanned and are available just for free to look at in Project Gutenberg. Um, I encourage you to seek them out because they are actually really amazing. Um, whoever suggested them as something to look at, thank you very much. Um, I probably could have spent the entire stream on just the three works that we have from her, but I wanted to uh, highlight uh, the other two scientists as well. So thank you for indulging me in that. Um, yeah, I think they were hypothetical people used as a presentation tool. That is my guess. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining me. Um, I, the next week, uh, I will be live again at 2.30 p.m. Eastern for another Archival Adventures. Um, and what we're gonna be looking at next week are the Frank Robeson papers. Um, and Robeson, uh, blah, 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 blah. he was a mathematician and an engineer. He taught math and engineering before getting his doctorate and then uh, becoming a professor of physics. Um, and he taught physics here at Virginia Tech <clears throat> and ended up retiring as the head of the physics department here. Um, he was teaching physics during the uh, last part of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and we have a number of his papers uh, that include instructional materials about how physics was taught in the age when the Manhattan Project was going on. And um, he, the, the physics building here is named after him. And at a point in the past uh, was actually the first university building in North America, I believe. Uh, I would have to go back to my notes to see exactly the geography, but the first to have a nuclear reactor installed inside of it for educational purposes, um, which I think fits very well with the building having been named after him. Uh, so I don't have a lot on the nuclear reactor. I may pull a couple of those things and we may look at them alongside the materials. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting to look at his stuff and kind of see how was physics taught uh, before we had fully developed the nuclear bomb. Uh, so that is what we're going to look at next week. Um, and I hope that you will join me for that. Uh, I'm going to pull up and see exactly where we're going to raid. I think um, I did see a wonderful streamer pop in earlier and so we may actually not go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium today. I think uh, we'll go say hi to somebody who popped in and joined us for chat a little bit earlier um, and we're gonna say hello to Stephen Joyce. Uh, so join me for that raid. Um, this is also appropriate. Uh, because uh, Stephen is a streamer who streams out of Edinburgh, Scotland, and we were looking at some uh, a, a Scottish scientist earlier. So um, we're gonna pop on over, say hello to Stephen Joyce, and um, yeah, I, I hope that I will see you again soon for another Archival Adventures. Um, until I do, I hope that you uh, continue to enjoy exploring history, um, and I thank you very, very much for joining me on Archival Adventures.